I've been looking for a Remington rolling block rifle for a while now. I have a couple previous videos on shooting an Argentine rolling block, but I have to confess, it's the one gun on my channel that doesn't actually belong to me, it's a buddy's, so I've wanted one of my own. I settled on a Swedish rolling block, since they still seem to be importing them at various times. I bought this one from Simpson Limited. Their inventory seems to be a mix of consignment guns, with prices varying wildly, and guns that they've imported themselves, particularly from Sweden and Switzerland. On those, their prices are fair, especially when compared to Gunbroker or other vendors. I got my Swiss K11 from them a few years ago, and going back over a decade, my Luger. But getting back to these rolling blocks, the Swedes come in two varieties, the latter being converted to fire the same 8x58R smokeless powder cartridge that I shoot in my Danish crags. But the original model, with its older big bore black powder cartridge, is just cool. And that's what I ended up with here, an original 1867 model, chambered in 12.17x44R, though it has been converted from the original rimfire to centerfire. The rolling block action works by first cocking the hammer, then the breech block can be opened in order to load a cartridge, then it can be closed and the rifle can be fired. Let's take another look. When the breech block is opened, it prevents the hammer from falling. After the breech block is closed, the hammer is free to fall and strike the firing pin. The rounded base of the hammer pivots behind the breech block, preventing it from being opened while the hammer is falling. Inside, on the workbench, I can take a closer look at this specific rifle. Overall, it's in good condition, although it could use a thorough cleaning. Taking a look at the markings, this rifle was made by Husqvarna. Husqvarna originated as a Swedish state arsenal in the late 17th century and produced arms exclusively until diversifying into sewing machines, bicycles, and stoves in the mid to late 19th century. They continued to produce firearms until the 1960s. This rifle was made in 1874. It's also stamped on the forend and the buttstock along with an H above. On the other side is the serial number, which is matching on the buttstock, the forend, and on the barrel. Jumping away for a second, it's also on the butt plate. The forend may be a replacement, as the serial number looks like it was stamped over top of another. These locking screws holding in the pivot pins for the breech block and the hammer are an example of an early pattern rolling block design. Ladder patterns used a one-piece plate to retain both pins. The action functions well, with the hammer locking into the half cock and the firing notches. The breech block moves freely, triggering the extractor when it's opened all the way. However, the firing pin seems to be stuck in the forward position. There's also an H on top of the barrel for Husqvarna. The rear sight starts at 120 meters with steps up to 300 meters. From there, the ladder can be flipped up for longer ranges, although the slider is a bit loose. The fore end is solid. It is missing the cleaning rod, which should be underneath the barrel. And on the other side of the barrel is a lug for the sword bayonet, although most use the socket bayonet that fits on the front sight. While the exterior is a bit rough, the bore is in great condition, with very deep grooves. As you've seen, this rifle is in fair overall condition, but it could really use a disassembly and cleaning. There is some rust, mostly on the barrel, and that will need to be converted. And then there is the matter of the stuck firing pin. So let's get started with taking this rifle apart. I'll start by removing the three bands on the fore end. Then 
the forend comes off. The forend has the original serial number marked in pencil, 2187. There's some rust and dirt below the barrel, but nothing too concerning as I don't see any pitting. The date is stamped on the barrel. The buttstock is held on by only one screw. To remove the butt plate, I'll first clean out the screw slots. The screwdriver isn't fitting well on the bottom screw. The next size down is a better fit. The buttstock is also marked with a pencil. With the furniture removed, I'll turn my attention to the action, starting with the breech block. The retaining screw comes right out. I'll make sure to keep these organized so they go back into the same spots. The axis pin has a slot in it but it actually just slides out. Then I can remove the breech block. I'll carefully release the spring tension on the hammer. Then the pin can be removed, as well as the hammer. These two screws look to be for the trigger plate. For the front screw, I'll use pliers to turn while pressing down on the screwdriver. That broke it loose. And the plate can be removed. I'll get to this in a bit. For now, I'll finish up on the receiver. The screw is for the extractor. I'll pull it out the back. This part looks to be bent, but it has a screw head, so I'll try to undo it. Looks like it wasn't fully threaded in. This is the retainer for the cleaning rod. Now to take apart the trigger group, starting with the mainspring. There's two more springs, the trigger spring, and then the spring at the front. It puts pressure on this arm that biases the breech block either open or closed. The pin is stuck, but the trigger pin just falls right out.
The front pin just needed a few taps. It doesn't look like there's a way to remove this leg swivel without driving out this pin, which is likely a tight fit, so I'll leave it be. The firing pin retainer screw in the breech block is stuck. Even with it in the vise and using pliers to help turn, I'll add some croil. To work it in, I'll see if I can move the firing pin. Before I try to undo this again, I'll fix the deformed screw slot. Then I'll hammer in a slightly bigger screwdriver. And thankfully, it comes out. Out comes the firing pin. It looks like it's free-floating in the breech block, since there's no spring. Hopefully once I clean everything up, the firing pin will be able to move more freely. With everything disassembled, I'll start cleaning all the parts. It's important to degrease everything before boiling. Like I said, I'll be boiling all of the metal parts to convert the rust into bluing. I'll add all of the small parts to the pot. This vertical tube is for the barreled action. I'll slide it in there. It's too narrow to fit the action all the way, so instead of the cap, I'll add foil to trap the steam. Once the water is boiling, I'll place the steam tube on top. After about 45 minutes, I can shut off the gas. Removing the foil. Something's missing. Looks like the action slid down the tube. The heat from the steam must have softened the PVC into an oval shape, but now the action is stuck. I'll try to fish it out.
I'll try to squeeze the tube to have it release the action. That worked. I'll just have to do it again near the top. Then I can finally pull it out. The rest of the parts will have to be pulled out of here. There's all of them back inside. The heat evaporates the water quickly. Next, I'll be using this carding wheel. Using a light touch won't impact the finish. It'll just remove the rust loosened by the boiling. Once all the parts are carded, I'll give them a final clean and kerosene to displace any leftover water. The bare metal and converted rust now needs a coat of protection. I'll give them a douse in oil and make sure to wipe down the barrel. While the metal is soaking up the oil, I'll turn my attention to the wood. It doesn't need anything really, just a light cleaning. The sticker does have to go however. I won't take any chances, and I'll use a heat gun to remove it. Then I'll give the wood a light cleaning with mineral spirits to clean up any dirt. But honestly, there's not much at all. And once it dried, the after looks just the same as the before. There's all of the metal parts wiped down. Oil is still in many of the holes and on the threads, so not much more is needed while reassembling. I'll start with the firing pin in the breech block. I'll make sure it can move freely. Then the trigger assembly. The trigger pin goes right in.
the front pin needs a squeeze to seat all the way. The two smaller flat springs and screws are nearly identical, so I checked my previous footage to make sure that they're going back into the right spots. The mainspring completes the trigger assembly. This time I won't forget about the rear sight. I'll use two pairs of pliers to compress the spring and to squeeze in the pin. The extractor slides right in. I'll check that it's able to move freely. I'll orient the cleaning rod retainer so the cross hole is in line. Then I can add the trigger assembly. Next is the hammer with its pin and retaining screw. And now I could see why there's a screw slot in the pins. I'll cock back the hammer to fit the breech block. Everything looks to be working correctly. For the furniture, I'll prep the bands. I applied paste wax on the butt plate screws to ensure they go in smoothly. The fore end drops right in. I'll add on the bands.
Here's the cleaned, converted, and assembled rifle, but I can't shake the feeling that something is missing. The cleaning rod. I'll be making my own. I researched it online and came up with this drawing of the head. Before I assembled the retainer and the receiver, I measured the thread size and pitch and ran a tap through to clean them up. Here I'm cutting the corresponding thread on the end of the rod, a piece of steel from the hardware store. Now I'll start on the head of the cleaning rod. I ground this tool in order to repeat the cuts to make up the jag portion of the head. For the slot in the middle, I'll spot drill on either end. And then drill them out. I ended up drilling another hole in between them. I don't have a small enough end mill to cut the slot on the lathe, so here I'm filing it in by hand.
I'll tighten the rod and the rifle. Then I can mark the length. It's very hard to start a die straight by hand, and evidently I need more practice, but I can straighten it out easily enough by bending. Then I'll smooth out the transition in between the two pieces. There's the completed cleaning rod. It's not perfect, but I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. With the rifle now feeling a bit more complete, there's one more thing to do, and that, of course, is to shoot it. I bought preformed cases from Buffalo Arms for a very reasonable price. I also got a set of 5070 dies, which can be used in place of a specific die set. Last, I bought a Lee bullet mold, again, one intended for making 5070 bullets. I used those three to make this, a dummy round without a primer. It's a snug fit, but it will chamber and eject just fine. Now to load up some actual rounds. Here's the completed 10 rounds. Now to head to the range.
It's funny because it's got a decent, it's got a decent amount of kick, but uh, but it just does There's no, there's no volume. <laughs> the rifle shot all ten rounds flawlessly. The grouping was decent too, especially for just throwing rounds down range. They did hit low, however, and like you heard at the range, the recoil was less than expected. When I was loading the rounds, I put in 55 grains of black powder. That's as much as I could fit without really compressing it. I read that others load between 62 and 72 grains with the help of drop tubes to help the powder settle and compression dies to bring it down. And that's my next step. But as for the rifle, I'm very happy with how it turned out. It's a fun shooter, and once cleaned up, a fine looking rifle. Thanks for watching.